Well, good morning. Uh, it is uh, good to be back uh, with you. My wife and I uh, were gone uh, last week enjoying some, some time away where the, the weather was slightly cooler. Uh, and we just uh, enjoyed some, some time with our uh, boys. And those of you who have young children, you know that even a, a vacation with a one-year-old and a three-year-old is very different uh, than uh, just time away uh, together. But it was still uh, a time of uh, great memories uh, and refreshment. Uh, and I know uh, Jacob did a great job uh, last week preaching to you from Galatians uh, 5. And I'm so thankful uh, for Jacob, for his ministry of the word, uh, to our youth students and his uh, faithful shepherding there. And uh, it's so good to be back with you again this morning, to, to hear you singing, to, to worship with you uh, through song, and to be able to, to come together again and continue our study of the household of God. Uh, of what the, the church is called uh, to do uh, and to be. Uh, and I have uh, enjoyed uh, this uh, study thoroughly. I've enjoyed uh, just really being able to, to speak from my heart and what our passion and, and vision for the church is. Uh, and uh, we believe that that is uh, firmly rooted and built upon the foundation uh, of Scripture. Uh, and we want to uh, just unify together around that vision for our church uh, and begin to move forward together. But uh, we're going to be uh, kind of bouncing around a couple of different uh, places. If you want to open your Bible so you're ready uh, to John chapter 16. Uh, and uh, this morning's message is going to be on uh, the, the power of the church, uh, who is the, the Holy Spirit. Uh, and as you're turning there to John 16, we will eventually uh, come to land there uh, as the first point that we'll study. But as you're, you're turning there to John 16, in the middle of the, the 1700s, both in uh, England and its North American colonies, there was a, a sudden and profound moving in the hearts and minds of people, drawing them to believe in Jesus as the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Now, thousands of people during that time repented of their sin and placed their faith and their trust in Christ. Think about that. Thousands of people uh, in the North American colonies and in England. And uh, there were, uh, there was a great outpouring of emotion as men like George Whitfield, who was a traveling preacher who went up and down uh, the colonies and traveled in uh, England as well. And he, he was a, an itinerant preacher going from town to town, preaching and proclaiming the, the good news of the gospel. Uh, also proclaiming the bad news that everyone is, is sinful and, and stands condemned before a holy God. But our, our only hope is to be found in the person of God's Son, who lived and died for sinners. It was a, a very basic message that George Whitfield was proclaiming from town to town. And it was amazing the response that he received. Uh, when he came to town, everybody gathered. Hundreds and thousands of people would come to hear him. And the legends had it that his voice could carry up to uh, a mile or, or no, that, I misspoke there. But uh, Benjamin Franklin famously did a, an experiment uh, judging how many people could hear uh, George Whitfield's voice, and he concluded probably about 50,000 people as he, he did an experiment. He, could, he walked from where George Whitfield was, and he stopped when he could no longer hear him, and he estimated the area. So, so George Whitfield had some pipes. Uh, he, he could speak loudly and boldly proclaim the gospel, and as he proclaimed the gospel, people came to faith at an almost an unprecedented rate. But there were others who, who pastored small churches, who, who preached the gospel faithfully and saw an amazing result. Men like Jonathan Edwards, uh, who, who pastored a small church in Massachusetts. And there was great revival there. And, and what I mean by revival, I mean that as, as the, the gospel was proclaimed, as uh, the, the pastor, the preacher would, would speak the truth about sin and salvation, the people in the audience would be so convicted over their sin that they would weep. That they, they would gnash their, their teeth, that they would, they would beat their breasts just like uh, the tax collector in the, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And, and we, there was this great outpouring of uh, emotion where the gospel was being proclaimed, not only by George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards, but by, by many faithful pastors in uh, Great Britain and in the, 
the colonies at that time. And, and this period in history became known as the Great Awakening. It was an, an amazing time. And it truly was a great period of revival. And everybody understood that there was a profound movement of the Holy Spirit at work among the people at that time. As so many were coming to genuine saving faith. And that this was a, a work of God was evident because the, these men who were proclaiming the gospel, they were just doing ordinary things. They were just teaching God's word. They were just pointing people to Christ. They, they were utilizing the ordinary means of grace that I, I spoke about two weeks ago when we looked at uh, the role of discipleship in the local church. Right? The ordinary means of grace, the proclamation of God's word. Fellowship, prayer, baptism, the Lord's table, devotion to God's word. This was true revival, and I appreciate the definition of revival that a church historian, Ian Murray, gives. He says, true revival is God using ordinary means to effect extraordinary change. Now, we, we do basic things, and God multiplies the results. So what's really interesting is that in the, the decades that followed the Great Awakening, which was in the middle of the 1700s, there were other pastors and other preachers who sought to, to recreate what took place. And in, in seeking to recreate the many spiritual transformations that occurred during the Great Awakening, they, they began to, to no longer rely upon the, the ordinary means of grace, but they began to rely upon their own human ingenuity. They began to try and uh, use human methods uh, to recreate the works of the Spirit. Uh, and ultimately, uh, this, this failed and produced something else because uh, human beings are unable to recreate or to reproduce or to prompt what only the Spirit can do. And so what do I mean when I said that these, these pastors and these, these preachers and trying to, to replicate, uh, to create a, a second great awakening as it became known, uh, they began to, to use certain techniques that, that put pressure upon people and sought to manipulate them as they were there hearing God's word. And what those means were, sometimes it was just a an altar call, or what they call the anxious bench, or sincere, or this is emotionalism, and uh, this is this is continued into modern day. Several years ago, there was a, a church in I think one of the Carolinas, pastored by by Stephen Furtick, and the church published a guide to spontaneous baptisms, and, and a part of that guide included planting people at the back of the auditorium. And then sending them forward during the altar call so that people would get the feeling that, that all of these other people were being moved to go and be baptized and that they should go as well. And they published this guide online with all of these things. And they said, hey, plant people in the back and have them move forward in, in, in the most visible walkways so that other people would feel that pressure and that urge to come forward. And the church historian that I quoted earlier Ian Murray, he creates this, this distinction. That there's true revival, and then there is revivalism. And he defines them in this way, that again, revival is God using ordinary means to effect extraordinary change. And revivalism is man trying to use extraordinary means to effect the same extraordinary change. But, but we are unable to to do what only God can do. And this brings up a, a temptation that is common to, to everyone who is a believer. And that temptation is for us to try and m manipulate or do in our own strength what only God is able to do. Right? In what ways do we, do we feel this temptation? Well, every believing parent faces the temptation to try and manipulate or coerce or try and create within their children faith, right? Now, there's some things that we are called to do to teach our children, to, to point them to Christ, to proclaim the gospel. And we can do those things, but can we give our children faith? No. 
but we face that temptation. Family members long to see loved ones set free from, from patterns and habits of sin and unbelief. We, we long to see friends and neighbors and others embrace Jesus as Lord and Savior. But, but we need to make sure that we're not manipulating them into something that they don't really understand. I'm speaking with uh, someone several weeks back, and he, he had been speaking in, with a co-worker and, and just asking him about his faith and trying to share the gospel. And this person said, oh, he had all of that taken care of because there was a big church event, and, and this man had gone forward and, and made a decision. Uh, and uh, this gentleman here in our church that I was speaking with, he just asked his co-worker, so what did that mean, or what, what does you understand that did? And, and the person couldn't answer. So here he, he thought that he had, in essence, been saved and made right with God because he made this decision and, and went forward, but he really had no comprehension of what that even meant. No comprehension of the gospel. But and this is the temptation that we face. And really the temptation is to give someone a work, to give something, uh, to give someone something to do in order to be saved. And it's a, it's a variety of things. It can be, you know, parents telling their children, well, just pray this prayer, repeat after me, or let's get baptized. Or walking an aisle and making a decision. We can, we can encourage those actions, but actually none of them are able to regenerate the human heart. None of them are able to impart spiritual life. None of them are able to transform who we are fundamentally in our nature. But we all face this temptation to use human means to try and accomplish what only God can do. Which presents us with an interesting and an important question, right? Who or what is the power of the church? Are we as Christians the power behind the ministry of the church, or is God, and specifically the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity? Or is it, is it some type of a combination of God and man working in the church? And if that is the case, who is it that, that leads in that situation? Do we command the Spirit— and tell him what to do, or does, or do we respond to the Spirit? Is he leading? Is he guiding? And ultimately, where we're going to, to land this morning, and what I'm going to, to argue and present to you, is that the Holy Spirit is the one who grows, empowers, and energizes the church. And without his working, there would be no spiritual growth in the church. There would be no addition. There would be no people coming to faith. There would be no spiritual growth in the church. And there would really be no continuing of the church. That's what I want to look at this morning. So in what way is the Holy Spirit the power of the church? And, and how does his being the power of the church change our ministry? The way that we, we conduct ourselves as a church. How does that, how are those two connected? Well, what I want to look at this morning is that we can count four ways in which the Holy Spirit is the power of the church. And the, and the first way is this, that he is the helper who convicts of sin. And we should all be there in John chapter 16. This is what we're going to see. This is Jesus' discussion with his disciples on his final night with them. They have left uh, the upper room, and they are on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus is going to speak to them about the helper that he's going to send them. And if you look with me, <clears throat> beginning in verse 8, where Jesus says this, And when he comes, speaking of the helper mentioned in verse 7, And when he comes, he will convict the world— Concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. And concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. 
Now what Jesus is, is saying to his disciples, he's unfolding a part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That, hey, when the Spirit comes, here's what he's going to do. And Jesus is saying, this is going to be the ministry of the Spirit as it pertains to the whole world. Believers and unbelievers. This is how the Spirit is going to work. The Spirit is the one who brings conviction upon the human heart concerning three spiritual realities. And he lists them out there and then explains each one of them. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. And he explains how the Spirit convicts us of sin. It impresses upon our hearts not just each individual sin. The Spirit does do that. But it, specifically here, Jesus is saying the Spirit is going to be the one who impresses upon the human heart the sin. The sin that ultimately all people will be judged for, and that is unbelief. But because uh, the Spirit is going to be the one who convicts people of their unbelief in Christ. The greatest of all sins. The Spirit will also convict of righteousness. And, and Jesus says something unique. And you're like, well, what is he saying? He says he's going to convict of righteousness because Jesus is going. You're kind of scratching your head like, well, what is he saying? Well, when Jesus was here on the earth, Jesus was the perfect example of holy God. He is the image of God, the exact representation of the nature of God. And so if you wanted to, to see the holiness of God when Jesus was on the earth, where would you look? You would look at Christ and see him in all of his perfections. But now that Christ is gone, who do we look to? Where, where do we find the holiness of God? And it is the, the spirit that impresses the holiness of God, the righteousness of God upon our hearts. Christ is gone, so he's no longer the physical example here, but we have the example in his word, and the Spirit impresses the righteousness of God upon our hearts. And then third, the Spirit also convicts us of judgment, that there is a judgment to come. And again, he does this in a unique way. He, he points to saying, hey, the Spirit is going to convict of judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. And the idea is that it, for, for the, the world to see and understand that at the cross, Jesus defeated Satan. He defeated the ruler of this world. And if Jesus defeated the ruler of this world, what are the implications for everyone else who is in like-minded rebellion? Right? If the rebellion leader has been judged, that, that's bad for everyone else who's in rebellion. Uh, and if the leader has been judged, then we can rest assured that if we are also in rebellion against the Holy God, that we too will be judged in like manner. As we look at all of this, we, what we see is it is the Holy Spirit who brings conviction in those three areas, sin, righteousness, and judgment. In essence, when, when the Spirit works in that way, He is preparing the human heart for salvation. When the truth of God's Word is proclaimed, the Spirit begins to work. And God's Word and God's Spirit always work in tandem to bring conviction upon the human heart. And this is, this is really evident when you share the gospel with someone else. Uh, I love, uh, any of you ever watch any of the videos of Ray Comfort, uh, the, the Way of the Master? Well, what's amazing is that he, he is this uh, evangelist that goes and has, you know, cold turkey conversations with people who go down to the Santa Monica Pier and other places where there's big crowds. And, and he will record his conversation uh, with people. He'll just walk up to them and start a conversation. And, and what's amazing is that those conversations will oftentimes start with the person being on guard and being a little hostile. Uh, and, and what's amazing, Ray Comfort has this very winsome way. He's got a cool Aussie accent uh, that I maybe should try and replicate in my evangelism and be more effective. But as he has these conversations with people, and it, they're initially hostile and, and hard-hearted, he, he begins to, to ask them questions. And he, he points to the law. He points specifically to the Ten Commandments and asks people questions and say, hey, are you a good person? And almost everyone says... Yes. Uh, and so he just, he does a little bit further. Well, have you heard of the Ten Commandments? And how do you measure up to those? And, and as he goes through some of the, 
the, the Ten Commandments and, and starts to, to connect the dots for people. And have, you ever, have you ever stolen? Have you ever lied? Have you ever looked with lust? And people were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then what's amazing is uh, as they begin to, to think about these things, you see their countenance change. You see it soften. And you see people begin to feel the conviction of the Spirit as the truth of God comes and is spoken to them. You see their countenance change. And some of them are, are brought to tears. And after Ray Comfort shares the bad news with him, that we are all condemned and we measure ourselves up against the, the law of God and we fail miserably, then he shares the good news. It says, but your hope is to be found in Jesus Christ, the perfect one who lived and died for sinners. You see that conviction on their face, but what's, what's also sad to see is that not everybody has a softened countenance when the, when the word of God is spoken. That, that's one option, right? That a countenance is softened, but the other option is for a countenance to be hardened, for the hostility to, to increase. And I have also seen and experienced that all too often, uh, sharing the gospel with others. And the conviction of the Spirit is felt, but then it's rejected. And sometimes when we proclaim the Word of God, sometimes it will lead to conviction, and then the Lord will, will work and save. The Spirit will regenerate the human heart, but at other times there will only be conviction. But we are called to, to proclaim. And, and here, if, if the ministry of the Spirit is He is the one who convicts, what does that mean you and I don't necessarily have to do? We don't have to be angry. Well, we don't have to, to press on and really strive to, to shame someone. Well, we, we can speak graciously and kindly. Again, the amazing thing about Ray Comfort is he's speaking face to face with people and telling them really hard things. And he's still alive. <laughs> he, he's not gotten into fist fights and been attacked and, and killed and stoned, but he has this way of speaking graciously and winsomely. And he just leaves the conviction to the Spirit. And that's the same thing that we need to do. Parents, as we, as we speak with our children, you don't need to shame them. You just you speak the truth and you point them to Christ. Point them to God's Word and trust, especially if, if your child is a believer, trust that the Spirit will work. Say, Spirit, this is not something that I can do. And spouses, this is also really hard, and, but also really applicable. Uh, you are a part of your spouse's sanctification, right? The Lord's going to use you in a profound way, but you need to leave the conviction to the Holy Spirit. So rather than nagging constantly and to bring up all of those things, we can speak the truth and then leave, leave that and allow the, the Spirit to work upon the heart of our spouse or someone else, some other believer who's in sin. We always have this temptation of, of pushing forward and forward. And what is it that we want to manipulate and control? The conviction of that person's heart. But the reality is that the Spirit is the one who brings conviction. So we speak God's word, and then we leave the results up to him. The Holy Spirit is the helper who convicts of sin, but that is merely the beginning of his ministry. Secondly, what we see is that he is the agent who applies our salvation. We have, we have spoken in the past that we need to see our salvation as something that each member of the triune God has participated in. God the Father is the architect of our salvation. He is the one who has planned it from eternity past. God the Son is the one who has accomplished our salvation by going to the cross, by living a perfect, sinless life. But God the Spirit is the one who applies our salvation to us. 
God the Father is the architect. God the Son is the one who accomplished it. The Spirit is the one who applies it to our hearts. The Spirit applies what the Father has planned and what Christ has accomplished. And what we've seen in our study of John's gospel, yes, we, we place our faith and our trust in Christ's finished work. But it's the Spirit who, who regenerates our hearts, who, who takes out the old heart of stone and, and replaces it with a softened heart of flesh. This is what, what Jesus himself spoke and, and said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He said this, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Jesus says regeneration has to take place. That the Spirit has to work. He has to move in order for someone to be saved. The Spirit has to apply what Christ has accomplished to us. And the Spirit is the agent who accomplishes that. The one who is sent by the Father and the Son to apply the gospel to our lives. If you, if you turn over with me to Titus chapter 3. The Apostle Paul unfolds all of this, speaking about our salvation. So Titus chapter 3, beginning in verse 3, he writes, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Right? That, that was all of us before we knew Christ. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. And then how was that applied to us? By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So you can think of it this way. If there was a, a, a king of a nation, and he sends forth one of his generals to go and, and make war, to go and conquer, and the general is victorious and conquers his foes, and so the, because the, the general is victorious, the king declares peace. But then the general and the king send an ambassador to declare peace to the people and to help them know what are the peace terms. What does this mean? That, that is what takes place in our salvation. God the Son has conquered sin and death. God the Father has declared peace, and they have both sent God the Spirit to be our helper, to be our comforter, to work out the results among the people. But imagine that scenario if the ambassador doesn't go forth. If the, the, the peace has been won, but it's never proclaimed and applied to the people. What's amazing is we began our study in John 16, and we read verses 8 through 11. This is what verse 7 says. This is what, what Jesus said immediately before what we studied. It says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go... I will send him to you. Most of us understand that if Jesus doesn't go to the cross, there is no victory. That, that there's no power to the gospel. But we, we kind of tend to sideline the work of the Spirit. And, and the victory is not life transforming unless the Spirit is sent forth to do his work. What do we make of all of this? Can we, we have to remember that it's the Spirit who convicts and it is the Spirit who gives life. 
That, that we, we don't give life, impart life to anyone else. It's an act of a sovereign God. We proclaim God's word and we pray for God's spirit to transform hearts and lives. And salvation belongs to the Lord and he has sent the Holy Spirit to apply that salvation, what has been accomplished, to our hearts. Now, and, and the church grows not as we manipulate people into decisions. The church grows not as we can get people to perform any one action. The church grows as the Spirit moves, now, as the Spirit works upon the human heart. And we have to keep that in mind as we, as we share the gospel with others, as we teach our children. Now, as we disciple others, only the Spirit can give spiritual life. And, and we, we have to keep that in mind, even as we, as we seek to, to give assurance to others. Right? If the Spirit is the one who gives life, uh, as, as people struggle with assurance, how do, I, how do I know if I'm saved? We should never point to a work that they have done. Right? If someone's struggling with assurance, don't point to, hey, you prayed this prayer, or you walked this aisle, or you were baptized. Because in doing that, we were pointing to a work, something that they have done. What should we point them to? To God's Word. Say, do you believe in the crucified and risen Savior? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God slain on your behalf to pay the penalty for your sin? And, and if they say yes, then we, we teach them to trust in the Word of God, to trust in those promises rather than in trusting in what they have done. And Vincent kind of stole some of my thunder during the scripture reading because I was going to point to the passage that he talked about. Just that idea of whoever has the Son has life, and whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. And the Apostle John wrote that letter that we're going to be reading next month in our growth groups. He wrote that letter so that we may know that we have eternal life. And what's amazing is if the, if the Spirit is the one who convicts and the one who, who gives life, then, then really the greatest assurance of our salvation is any evidence in our life that the Spirit has worked. The fruit of the Spirit is the great, greatest assurance of our salvation. And that leads to what we're gonna what we're gonna look at next. That if the Spirit has has worked to to make a heart new, if we are a new creation, our life will look different. We will look like a new creation. And that goes to our our third way in which the the Spirit empowers the church that he is the teacher who empowers our sanctification. That the Spirit working within us teaches us from God's Word and empowers us to be transformed in an ongoing, continual manner so that we are made more and more into the image and likeness of Christ. And while salvation belongs to God alone— our, our justification, our sanctification, we are called to participate in. We are uh, called to be empowered by the Spirit. We are responsible for our sanctification. We can't accomplish it uh, in our own strength and wisdom. It's something that the, the Spirit enables us to do. If you turn with me over to Galatians chapter 3. Paul makes this point clear, and, and he connects justification, being declared righteous by faith, with our sanctification, this process of growing more and more like Christ. At the beginning of Galatians chapter 3, he says, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? And are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, 
are you now being perfected by the flesh? So Paul's argument is this. How did you receive the Spirit, Galatians? It wasn't through things that you've done. It was through the gift of faith in your life. And if that's how you were saved, how are you going to be sanctified? How are you going to continue to grow? It's not going to be in your wisdom and in your strength. It's going to be by the power of the Spirit. And as Christians, we can still struggle against the Spirit of God within us. We still struggle with old habits of sinful thinking and sinful actions. And even uh, what Jacob preached last week, right? We're called to selfless service, but what's, what are we still tempted to do? Selfish service, right? That's what we are tempted to. But if you look at the, the verses, if you turn the page over to Galatians 5, the verses immediately following what Jesus or what Jacob preached on last week, verse 16 in Galatians 5, says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For those, or these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. All right, so there's this, this battle that wages within us. The, the old sinful habits and, and the new spirit that, that lives within us. And what is it that we are commanded to do? We are to walk in the spirit. That is the command. Well, we, we are called to, to walk in him, to follow him. But how do, we, how do we do that? What does it mean to walk in the spirit the idea is to, to yield control to him by allowing him to lead and guide us, by allowing him to, to drive and direct us, to direct our affections, our attitudes, and our actions. You've, you've probably heard of the, the hit song by Carrie Underwood, Jesus Take the Wheel. Uh, a more theologically accurate one would be spirit take the wheel of lead me and, and guide me. And in the song, she just kind of throws her hands up now, while she's in the driver's seat. And she says, okay, Jesus, you take the wheel. And that's a bad example theologically, but, it, but it's helpful here for our illustration purposes because sometimes we, we feel like that's how we're supposed to be sanctified, right? We're called to drive. And then we say, okay, God, I'm tired of this. You just take over. And I'll just sit passively and idly, and you drive everything. But that's not what we're called to do. Well, we're called to be at the wheel, and our map of where to go is God's Word, and the Spirit is the one who's fueling us, who's guiding and directing us, who's there to say, oh, you're not following the map right now. You need to listen. Follow the map. And He's the one who empowers the car. He's the gas. He's the fuel who enables us to move forward in the Christian life. I love uh, what the Puritan John Owen says about how all of this works together. Because sometimes you're like, well, is the Spirit going to force me to do things that I don't want to do? And John Owen says this, that the, the Spirit works in us and with us, not against us or without us. So the Spirit isn't going to force you to do anything. It's going to be there to convict you. We've all felt that. But then we are called to respond. We are called to walk in Him, not to walk in ourselves. And there's really, there's two options given to us there in Galatians 5. You either walk in the Spirit or you will carry out the desires of the flesh. So those are the two options, and we are called to walk in the Spirit. And again, the, that same link can be made between God's Word and God's Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit works in and through God's Word, never against God's Word or without God's Word. And so the Spirit is not only the one who saves us, but also He is the one who enables us to be sanctified. So why does this even matter? Well, if, if you are really struggling with sin— and we can all say, yes, I, I'm struggling with sin. How do you know that you can change? What hope do you have that the sins that are besetting you, that are harming your relationships, that are making an impact upon your life, how do you have any hope 
that you can change those habits, that you can defeat that sin, that you can begin to pursue Christ, that you can walk in the Spirit rather than carrying out the desires of the flesh? How do you have any assurance that you can do that? Because the Spirit is within you. And because He's the one who empowers you, not just your own strength. And when we have been beaten down by our sin, and we feel defeated and hopeless, I pretty much guarantee we've been battling it in our own strength and in our own wisdom. That we haven't said, Spirit, take the wheel. Where am I to go and, and be the, the fuel to get me there? We maybe just put our hands up, said, get me there magically. That would be awesome if our sanctification worked that way, right? If we didn't have to work at it. Like it was just a magic wand, and when we're saved, we're also just immediately sanctified. Like, poof, we don't sin anymore. Like, whoa, that would be awesome. But that's not how the Lord has ordained it. He's going to work in us and through us, and it's the Spirit of God who's going to both teach and empower us so that we can walk in Him and have victory over our sin. And it's, it's going to be very uh, sobering as we read through 1 John next month. Uh, in our in our growth groups, because there's a so we're battling against sin. There's a difference between sin being in the believer and the believer being in sin. Right? There's a difference between us struggling with sin occasionally and, and battling against it with all of our strength and with the strength of the spirit. And there's another category of we're just giving in to the sin and being carried along with it. But the Spirit gives us hope that we can change, that we can follow Christ, that we can walk in the Spirit rather than giving in to the desires of the flesh. And yet while all of, all of these first three ways that the Spirit ministers, we've, we've looked at them, all of them have been benefits to us as individuals. But there's a fourth and, and final way that the Spirit ministers and would be this, that, that he is the gift giver who energizes our ministry. He is the gift giver who energizes our ministry. What we begin to, to see and understand that is if the Spirit has convicted us, if the Spirit has regenerated our hearts, if he's applied salvation to us, and if he is sanctifying us, then he is also going to gift us with spiritual gifts that we are given, not for our own benefit, but for the benefit of the entire church. Turn with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The Apostle Paul says this, beginning in verse 4. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. This is what we see. The other way that the, the Spirit empowers the church is to gift each and every believer with a certain blending of spiritual gifts. There are a variety of gifts, but it's the same Spirit who gives all of them. There are a variety of ways of serving, but it's the same Lord that we all serve. There are a variety of activities, but it's the same God who empowers all of those activities. And, and the gifts that each one of us has, they are not given for you, but they are given to you. They are given for you to use them to love others, to build others up. We're going to talk about this more next week as we look at the nature of the church is interdependence. That we are all members of one body, and some of you are hands, some of you are feet, some of you are the gallbladder, some of you are the mouth, the ear, the, the, the nose, and we need every single part of our church body. And we need every single part of our church body to function according to the gifts and abilities that the Lord has blessed you with. And we are given these gifts, and then 
we are called to, to utilize these gifts for the benefit of others. But again, it connects with what we looked at in our previous point, that we, we do this not according to our own strength, but it's the Spirit who energizes us. I love what Paul says in Colossians 1, verses 28 and 29. He says, Him we proclaim, speaking of Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. He says, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Our energy for ministry doesn't come from ourselves; It comes from God. He is the one who empowers and energizes us so that we can continue to minister to others because ministering to others is tiring, right? And you know what a common experience is just overall in America because of our culture is burnout, right? Uh, and and the, the culture has discipled the church uh, and, and we have been influenced and, and we be, become guilty of that. And again, we all fall into that trap of doing too much. Uh, we all have too much hair and not enough tortoise in us. We, we, we love to, to sprint and take on everything at once, but we, we, we think that faithful plotting, we, we tend to look down upon that. Well, we're, we're constantly sprinting and, and realizing that Again, faithful plotting is better than inconsistent sprinting. And we have to see and understand that what the Lord is calling us to is dependent effort in the church. That we continue to love, that we continue to serve, but we do that dependent not upon ourselves, but upon Him. And we utilize the spiritual gifts that we have, whatever they may be, for the benefit of the whole church. And we are all called to serve dependently for the glory of God. And faithful service for years and years, even in, in small ways, that is good and pleasing to the Lord rather than what seems to be flashy and, and, and upfront. One of the most encouraging things to me you know, is to read biographies of pastors. And I love there's a publisher called The Banner of Truth. And, and they're, what they're starting to do is they're, they're starting to, to publish biographies of pastors who weren't famous, uh, of pastors who went and ministered to small towns in Scotland for their entire life. They, they were faithful in that. And that's what we just need to strive to be, right? We, we, we labor faithfully, and again, we leave the results up to God. We, we've talked about that so much. We, we obey what he has commanded us to do, and then all of the, the results, all of the fruit of that, we leave to him. We entrust that to the Spirit, rather than trying to, to conjure it up in our own strength and in our own wisdom. That's what we, we need to strive for. And what we've looked at this morning, we need to be convinced of. The, the ministry of the Spirit encompasses conviction of sin, the, the application of our salvation, empowering us in our sanctification, and energizing our service. And we have to be convinced of those truths. Okay, that, that's where it has to begin. That if ministry is going to be carried out, it must be done in the, the strength and power of the Spirit. But there's something else to this that we have to, to keep in mind and we have to address in our hopes. And, and uh, as we talk about it, I want you to turn somewhere you probably wouldn't expect. I want you to turn in the Old Testament to the book of Jonah. You might be familiar with the story of Jonah. And he was a prophet of God who was commanded to go to the Gentile city, the city of Nineveh. And this prophet of God was commanded to proclaim to Nineveh that they are called to repentance, that judgment was coming. Okay. 
sorry. My, Jonah was moved from one place to another in my Bible. So uh, I finally found it. It's where it should be. But as, uh, as God commanded Jonah to go and preach to Nineveh, Jonah was supposed to head east to Nineveh, and he headed west to the Mediterranean Sea and hopped on a boat. And ultimately, the, the Lord brought a storm upon that boat, and Jonah finally said to the soldiers, all right, guys, here's what you got to do. If you want the storm to go away, you just pick me up and throw me into the ocean or into the Mediterranean Sea. And that's what they did, and the storms stopped. And what happened to Jonah? He gets swallowed up by a big fish, and he's there in a fish for three days and three nights. And chapter 2 in Jonah records Jonah's prayer. And Jonah's prayer ends with, with these words. If you look at verse 9. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. And then he, he says this statement. Salvation belongs to Yahweh. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And then he, he finally goes and does what he should have done originally. He goes in chapter 3 and proclaims in Nineveh. He calls them to repentance. And guess what? The king of Nineveh and the citizens, guess what they do? They repent. And what's amazing is that at the beginning of Jonah 4, we see Jonah's response to this. And this is what is said. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. See, what's amazing here, Jonah was convinced of the power of God. Jonah was convinced that God was able to transform the hearts of those Ninevites. Jonah was convinced that if he went, they would repent. So he was convinced of the truth of the power of God, but he did not want it. He didn't desire it. He says, God, I don't want you to work in the lives of those Ninevites. Jonah wanted them to be judged. And sometimes we have that same attitude, but not just that we don't desire God to work in the lives of other people. Sometimes we don't want God to work in our life, right? Sometimes we, we are convinced that he can work, but if God does work in my life, then that means this grip that I have on my sin, what's God going to do with that? Well, he's going to change me. He's going to relinquish that grip one finger at a time, right? And so sometimes we, we are convinced of the power of God, but we don't desire it in our hearts. That's where I say we have to, to know and understand that the power of our church, how any life is going to be transformed is only going to be by the power of God. We can't manipulate it. We can't manufacture it. We need to be convinced of that truth. But then we also have to desire the Spirit to work. We have to walk in the Spirit so that we do not gratify the desires of the flesh. And all of this we are convinced of these truths, and if we desire them in our lives, what will we experience? Well, we will experience boldness in evangelism, because God is the one who is able to convict. We will experience assurance of salvation, because salvation is in God's hands rather than in our hands. We will experience hope in our sanctification and uh, in the sanctification of others, realizing that any and all change is possible because the Spirit dwells within us. 
And finally, we will have joy in our service because we don't labor in our own strength, but we labor with dependent effort, energized by the Spirit of God working within us. Amen. That's what, that's what understanding the truth of the Holy Spirit's being the power of the church. That's how it implies and, and the implications for our life. And we need to embrace it. We need to desire it. And then we need to begin to live that out. Amen. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer.